Swinburne University of Technology. Um, my name is Mike Keppel. I'm the PVC Learning Transformation. Uh, started about three months ago. Delighted to welcome you here. Uh, I think this is the most number of people I've seen in this room, at least in three months. So, so well done. That's the first record we've set today, uh, which is great. Um, what we're looking at today is gamification in education. And we've got two speakers today. Uh, we've got Professor Dan Hunter, who's also written a book in the area. And we've got uh, Gronya Oates. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to have a great discussion. I think one of the first things to look at, uh, we need to have some questions ready to ask them at the end. Uh, and let's, let's have a good discussion about gamification. We'll continue this hopefully at our conference later in the year, which I think will be great as well. So I'll hand over to Dan first of all. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so my job is to be the warm-up act for Gronje, who is the, the main event, um, and, it's, and it's tough uh, you know, when the stones are coming on. So I'll try to get out of your way quickly um, so that Gronje can talk about what um, she's doing actually here um, in, uh, at Swinburne to actually start to implement some of these ideas. And so um, my basic role here is just to give you kind of an overview of what gamification is, because most people don't know what it is, and it's a really weird word, and it's sort of it's, it's easy to misunderstand what's going on. Um, so so um, there are sort of two different ways of, of thinking about gamification, and then I'll sort of blow it out a little bit. So one is, is it's really just about um, learning from games, right? So, so games are really interesting subjects for study. I, I started looking at these things about 10 uh, years ago when I started looking at, oh actually more than that, looking at video games. I was really interested in the way that uh, people use video games in the sort of the societies that come out of um, particularly places like World of Warcraft. Um, and then started to, to look at um, the, the studies of games. You know, so when, when people start looking at the way that games are constructed and what games actually are, um, there are lots of really fascinating accounts of it. But one of the, the most interesting things about it is that, that games are mechanisms for making people learn. Right? So, so if you think about Monopoly, for example, right, you, don't, you think of that as fun. But in fact, what you're actually doing during that process is that you're learning the rule set. Right? You actually have to understand what's going on and you have to start constructing strategies and then you're competing against others to work out um, who has the best strategy, who understands the system the best. And so as, as um, I was playing around with games, um, a colleague of, of mine uh, at, at the Wharton School, Kevin Werbach, and I, uh, we played a lot of World of Warcraft together. Um, don't ask, it's a, it's a very long story. Um, I used to run a research guild that was comprised of um, anthropologists and economists and others within World of Warcraft. But we started to think about, well, um, uh, how can we actually start using games to, to improve learning and a range of other things? And he was at a business school. I, I used to be at that same school. Um, and so we actually sort of started to think about, okay, so it's really about using the sorts of aspects of games to um, address real world problems. And so the definition that we came up with, we stuck in, um, in the, the first book that we did on this, uh, is the use of game elements and game design techniques in non-game contexts. I think there's another, yes, okay, so game elements. So this is the first aspect of it. When, when you start, when, when we think about games, you think about a game like Monopoly or, or any of the other sort of games, video games that you've, that you've played around with, um, one of the things that, that we sort of think of is, is the entire system, but you can actually start to decompose that into various different sorts of elements. Um, in, our, in our second book, or actually in the first and the second book, we, we sort of tried to divide it up into um, components and, and mechanics and some more abstract features, but we're not going to worry about that today. I can get into that a little bit more if you like, but really it's just about what each of these particular features that exist in games can we use in other settings. And the thing that we're using it for is to motivate people. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But when I talk about game elements, I'm going to be talking about things like um, competition as opposed to cooperation, or both of those, right? Or particular narratives that you might have within there, or progression within that, right? The sense uh, or series of emotions that might exist within that game that you're trying, that you're trying to capture. It might be that you've, you've actually got points within the system, um, experience points or badges or leaderboards. When we, when we talk about gamification these days, because it's now a reasonably well established kind of environment, people think about points, badges and leaderboards. So I'll come back to that very quickly in a bit because it's not about that. Uh, it's about all sorts of game elements, but, but we need to think about game elements to start with. Um, the other aspect is that it's, that it's not actually just things that we can put on top of um, an existing process. 
It's actually a design process. So all of the people in the design, uh, over in the, the design school will be familiar with this sort of thing, that it's actually about design thinking, that you're actually trying to take the entire system and come up with a way of using these elements, these features, in order to get the outcome that you want. Um, and then the other aspect about gamification that makes it gamification and not just games is that we're using it in non-game contexts. So the general area that, that, um, uh, that we looked at was business and public policy and certain other areas. The stuff that we're going to be focusing on today that Grania is going to be talking about um, is about the use of, of gamification, but more, more generally sort of the, the different systems that, that she's using in creating um, a, an app that relies on some of these particular ideas. Am I getting that right, Grania? I hope I haven't. I hope I'm not uh, stealing too much of your thunder. So the non-game context, the easiest one that you can sort of think of these days is um, Fitbit or any of the health tracking systems. Anyone here um, fallen for that one? Yes, okay, great, right? It's, not, it's actually not possible to have one of these quantified self uh, fitness apps without it having points, badges, and leaderboards in it, right? You know, you get a certain number of points, it's telling you how you're doing against goals, good job, badges, all of those sorts of things. We've seen those you know, many, many times before. So, so that's the sort of stuff that we're talking about. Now, to come back and, and sort of try to pull apart that definition, game elements, game design, and um, non-game contexts, um, here is um, a, a particular uh, game. This is like a, a familiar one. I can't even remember which one it is. It's one of the Empire games. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, it's where you build, a, um, uh, where you build a, uh, a world and you have to you know, take over certain aspects and you sort of build it out. So here are some of the elements that actually exist within this very straightforward game, thing that we'd think of as a game. So there are a certain number of points. These are used as resource features, okay? There are certain quests that people can do, right? You're given a task to you know, build up a certain um, number of, of features. So that's a quest, a thing that you can force, uh, or sorry, encourage the, the people to do. There's certain resources that you have that you want to collect. You want to get more and more of um, these particular resources in order to be able to build more. Uh, typically, you've got a social graph. Right, so you, all of the other friends within the system are able to be aware of it. We'll see some of, uh, similar sorts of things with, with Granu's one. Um, you've got an avatar, which is just a sort of a fancy game way of, of talking about um, the representation of you within, within the game. Um, the original usage of the word avatar was um, within, within Buddhist theology. It was the way that God or gods came down. Uh, sorry, versions of gods came down into the world. So they were the avatars. So this is you within the world. Um, and there's typically some kind of progression, right, where you actually are given, you know, your idea is that you're going to get better and better and better at this kind of thing. So this is a, th that, so that was a game, right? So that one is a game. It's actually a game game. This is, um, uh, this is a gamified um, business solution, right? So I'll just give you this one. This is Kias. It's an employment um, solution. It doesn't really matter. It was internally. It's, it's actually not so significant anymore, but it was just a good example. So, so there are various avatars which, which the people have within there. They get badges for doing certain things. They've got a social graph. They're connected to certain people. They've got quests, things they've got to do. They're weekly goals in the same way as with your Fitbit. You might have a weekly goal of, you know, dropping, uh, you know, a kilo or doing whatever. You've got various rewards, points, and so on. So the same sorts of elements that we see in games can be inserted into business-like contexts and as we'll see in a, in a minute also within education. Um, the, the thing that's interesting about this, I actually I, I could talk about Johan um, Heitzinger a, a great deal but, but I won't um, unless people have a particular interest. The, th the most important thing about, about gamification and the thing that everyone misses when they first I I engage in this is that it's about motivating people to do things. The, the great thing about, about gamification is it's another way of, of getting people to do things that you want them to do. And, and in the context of education, getting kids to do the things that we want them to do includes things like you know, going to the careers office, getting an idea, you know, like writing an essay, doing a range of things. If you think about the motivational structures that exist within, within the universities, they're crap. Okay? Right? What's the main motivational structure that we have within universities? Marks, right? right? It's, that's, like, that's like within, a, within a, an employment situation, the main motivational structure we've got is your, your salary or you're fired, which you know, within universities, your fire doesn't exist, right? So, but, but within the environment of the classroom, we think that the only way that we can motivate students right, is to give them marks, right? So the, the option or the process of gamification really gives us a different way of thinking, well, can we motivate them to do stuff because it's fun or interesting? 
Um, I'll throw this up. Um, actually, no, I won't, I won't throw that up. I'll ignore it because it's much more interesting to talk about what gamification is than what it isn't. Um, it, it's not, I will very quickly, it's not about making everything into a game. Sorry, I can't help myself. Right, I've got a set pattern and I've got to keep, keep on it. Um, it's not about making everything into a game. It's not about using any sorts of games uh, in a business or in an education context. It's not about bringing a game into the classroom. Right? It's about making the learning experience pleasurable to motivate kids to do stuff within this context, within the learning context. Um, and it's not s serious games, and I really won't talk about that, but it's definitely not points, badges, and leaderboards. Um, <coughs> gamification within education, um, I, I'll, it's much better if I just introduce this now and then we can talk about it and have a discussion and, and I'll just throw to Grania really quickly. Um, this is a, a project called Just Press Play, created by a friend of mine called Liz Lawley at um, Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT. Um, they're currently turning this into a, uh, an open source uh, or an open sourcey like um, platform. And the idea behind this was that, that they, they had um, their first year college students at RIT, particularly in the, the game design and graphic design area, um, they, they, were, they were coming in and they were doing certain things, but they weren't really connected. They weren't really engaged with um, the, the college. They weren't really engaged with, with RIT. So what they said is, well, we could gamify the first year experience. We could, we could actually give them cards that they had actually had to um, go out there and find, um, that we could give them challenges and quests. Um, this example here is a quest, right? So this one here um, is probably the easiest one here. The Washington crossing the Delaware quest was um, they, they, what they wanted to do with this quest is they wanted to get teams to form, right? Creating study groups and those sorts of things. We can do that, we can create study groups, right? But the kids wouldn't turn up to them and they wouldn't do it. So what they said is, okay, rather than trying to formalize study groups, what we'll do is we'll get them to give them a challenge to work in a team that's not assessed, right? But rather that actually forces them or encourages them, I'm sorry, to um, self-form. So this picture here that you can just sort of see is a picture of five or six kids inside a, a mock rowboat. Uh, and that's a very famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. I don't know if you've seen it, it's up there, you know, and, and you probably have, or you've seen representations of it. So the, the idea here was the quest was that they had to take a photograph of them as a group um, reenacting Washing, Washington crossing the Delaware. And of course the kids go, oh, this is great. It's really about, you know, being creative. It's not, it was about teamwork. Right? It was about getting them in a team and doing something. So they created these quests, they had points, they had all of the sorts of things that we have in gamification. But the point of it wasn't to make it like a game-like experience, it was to motivate the students to do stuff. And as we'll see with Grunya in a minute, there are other ways of, uh, of doing this and, and she's got a good example. Um, it's not possible for me to talk about gamification these days without talking about Duolingo because I'm obsessed with this particular app, um, uh, learning, learning Italian. Um, the thing that's great about Duolingo, and I encourage anyone, even those who don't want to do, um, uh, do uh, language study, the great thing about it is that it shows you really, really clearly how a very simple, clean interface with a small number of elements can really work incredibly well and very simply. So I've got, I've got a badge over here. It says my Italian fluency is 50%. Non giusto, right? I, it's not true, right? It's, I, it's not correct. Um, it's much lower than that. This is the sort of the different projects or the different um, uh, things that I, that I have learned. It's apparently not so great on basics one. Sorry, Amanda. Uh, basics two and phrases, I'm just, I'm, I'm full. I've got all full bars in relation to this. Um, my daily goal of, of 30 points, uh, of 30 experience points over here, I, I haven't met, but I'm on a seven day streak with 11 hours left, okay? So this actually, uh, each day, it kind of, I'm the sort of idiot who gets really motivated by the idea of like, oh no, right? I'm just about to lose my seven day streak, right? So I better, because I really want to have an eight day streak, because if I get up to 10 days, I get, um, uh, a lingot up here. I've got the lingots of the virtual currency, which is another aspect of, of gamification. And so what this does is it motivates me to actually do Italian every day, right? The, the get, to get 30 points, it's, it's basically about seven, eight minutes of Italian, you know, playing around. And there's various other elements within that. I would encourage all of you, if you're interested in different ways, a very low impact ways of doing, um, uh, encouraging students to do small amounts of stuff, um, take a look at Duolingo. Okay, so now I'm going to throw to Grunya. 
um, gamification at Swinburne. Um, have you you've got you. slides in relation to it? Yes, they're ready okay. to go, I yep. believe. Sir. Okay, great. All right, but just a so. second. No. Right, please feel free to buy <laughs> either of these two books because <laughs> <laughs> they're very reasonably priced. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, I'll be Matt. around obviously for questions later. Okay, everybody. So my name is Gronje Oates. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a senior lecturer in accounting in the Accounting Economics and Finance Department. And I convened the first year accounting unit, which has at times up to a thousand students sorry, in a semester. It's a core unit in the Bachelor of Business and you might find it hard to believe, but some students don't love having to do accounting. So we've got to try and find some ways to engage them with the unit and get them interested in actually performing well. So therefore we thought about what are some of the problems we're currently having. Some of the problems we were having was low engagement with the content itself. We have also have a problem, the students tell me, that they don't actually check student emails. And this is, of course, the way that we're communicating with, him, with them. And so I wanted to see what we could do about that as well. And also, Sandra, as Sandra points out, we have low retention rates. So I wanted to try and find a solution of what we could actually do to overcome some of these issues that we have but maintaining the high expectations that we have for the students. We wanted to increase engagement, increase the communication with the students, where they're actually getting this information we were sending out to them, and also, of course, increase student retention rates. So we thought about what are some of the things that we could do, and in class itself, I looked at wor working out ways of engaging the students, and we did that by playing some online games called Cahoots, which some of you may be familiar with where we put multiple choice questions on the board, all of the students brought their own devices, logged in and then competed against one another in class. And the feedback from them was that they thoroughly enjoyed doing this. They enjoyed the competitive nature of it, they enjoyed their interaction of it. But the issue with me was then, how could I actually get them to do this out of the class? How we, could we continue to maintain their interest? And so once I realized they didn't check student emails, we came up with the idea of developing a nap where they would actually have, get a push notification each day on their device to answer this question. So I set it up that they would answer one question per day, it was a multiple choice question, and that it would take only about at a maximum one minute to answer the question. And I'll go into some further information on that later. We ran a focus group with the students to see how they liked using the app and so on, and overall what they said was that they found it fun, which was one of the first things we wanted to do. We wanted also them to enjoy using it, and they said they really enjoyed the competitive nature of it. So we had the leaderboards and so on that Dan mentioned. And, but prior to all of that, of course, we had some challenges with how are we actually going to fund this um, project. So we were um, rejected a couple of times when we applied for grants, but we persevered as we do. And then Sandra, thank you, stepped in and helped us out to get some funding. That wasn't enough for the project, and then thankfully, and Professor Glenn Bates, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Student Advancement, thought it would be a really good idea and then actually funded the remainder of the project. So that was some of the issues we had. But some of the, we, I went ahead then and started to develop the app. And at this stage, I'd like to acknowledge Vincent, who is the developer of the app. Vincent, Vincent is a Swinburne graduate in computer science and also in gamification. And we thought, really, what better way to show off our innovations than have our own graduates to actually develop them? And also I'd like to acknowledge the help of Dan Lawrence. Dan has been to every one of our meetings and has been absolutely fantastic. So it was very much a team effort and not something that I did as an individual. So we looked at what are some of the, um, Vincent actually set up that we go through the user journey. What is the journey we want to take the students through? And by stepping through that journey, we came up with what are some of the principles of gamification to engage the students and th then actually reward them as they became involved with the game. And I'm going to go through each of these points with you later. But for the moment, I thought I'd show you what the app looks like and you'll be able to get a, have a play with it later. And how do the students actually ac access the app? So what we did was the students actually, once they're enrolled in Blackboard and once they're enrolled in the unit, they can sign into the app through their email address and their student email address and password. And obviously, we could actually set this up for any unit in the university. So the student subscribes to a specific class. So if you, as an academic, wanted to use this app for your own subject, you simply add your own content. The questions are released at set time. So I release one question per day, and it expires at the end of that day. However, the student can go back and review the question later. If they got the question incorrect, it'll tell them what the correct answer is. 
but it will also give them feedback to say go back and revise balance sheet and income statements and so on because that's an area that and they're having difficulty with. So it links back to the study materials. We have three headings here. We have, you can go in and answer your question. So my unit is called financial information for decision makers. They can check on the leaderboard how they're performing against their colleagues. And also then we can see which badges a student has actually earned. The other thing we added to this was the um, timer. So the student is under pressure when actually answering the question. So they have, depending on the question, 30 seconds or one minute to answer the question. The students' feedback was that they very much liked this feature because it did put them under pressure and in a test or exam situation, they will be under pressure. So they have a chance, they have, they're all multiple choice questions that I've set up and there is um, four choices that they um, select from. It's based on, so the leader for instance, is based on not just the correct answer but how fast you answer the question as well is um, one of the key elements that we had in there. We have four different badges that a student can earn, so consistent, they correctly answer five questions in a row. They can, if they're swift, they answer in a question less than 30 seconds to earn this badge. Century is where they earn more than 100 points. And then the leader where they're placed at the top of the leaderboard um, throughout the, the um, game. So you can see here we had the leaderboard. And what we've done here is, as Dan mentioned, sometimes leaderboards can be a demotivation for those students who are not performing well. So we've adjusted that you only see the 10 that are closest to you. And I'm very happy to get some advice or feedback that anybody has, of course, on any of these elements that we've added to the app. The back end of the app then allows us to do a number of things. So what we can do is we can edit the question so I can change it um, semester to semester if I like. What the title is, so I might have um, on a question on balance sheets. What are the maximum points that can be earned? Then what my question is and the um, options for the answers. I also can provide advice on where the student can go back. What material do I suggest they revise in terms of their actual learning in this um, unit? The unlock date for the question, what time it will unlock on, when that question will expire. And these are, these, so these are some of the elements at the back end. Also, we can configure the classes. So if some new students join the group or some students leave, that allows us to add or delete students as we go. This, I find, is a really interesting and I think really excellent part of the app is the analytics and the reports that we can get towards the end. So we can go in and identify which questions the students had difficulty with. And what that allows me to do essentially in real time is then the following week go back in and revise those concepts that the students have really struggled with. So it gives me real data on which are the areas they're having difficulty with. I can also review how a particular student is performing if we want to go to that level, how many badges they've earned and their individual students' engagement um, with the material as well. In terms of the unit, so we can see here the user question. So for instance, how many questions they got correct, incorrect, and so on, identifying for me, perhaps in preparing even for, excuse me, for the next semester and so on, what are the concepts that students are really struggling with and that perhaps I can design the unit, spending more time around those more um, difficult areas and so on. So is it scalable? Well, Vincent and Dan tell me yes, that it is. And there's um, not going to be any problem with it catering for a large number of students. So as I mentioned before, if you're an academic interested in using this app, you simply just need to add in your own content. And I'm sure Vincent can give you any further advice on what's um, needed at that stage. So um, that's really all I have to say about the app. And I'm very happy to answer any questions you have. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Vincent, do you want to uh, yep. go there? Um, so yeah, right now it's on only iOS or iPhones and uh, Android phones. Yeah. Other questions there? Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I can take one more. Uh, you mentioned that in the partnership with uh, the left area, they do have budgets that involve the government budget. I'm just wondering if there's been any thought about broadening it to other support 
games buying things like using the library to like track their friends. Mm. Just something to think. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Maybe that's something Sandra might like to um, speak about. Yeah. Sure let's do it here. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not compatible with Blackboard. No, it's currently is not compatible so with Blackboard. It will be at the end of the exercise. So I think Dan, you have a plan for the future that it could or would interface with Blackboard. Is that correct? Uh, so well, there are sorry. a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, the the question that you will have to ask is is do you want that information in in Blackboard for no, summative well. assessment, or do you are you happy with the reporting structure that I that other well, I, I didn't quite understand what you said. What wasn't compatible? I'd like to use the Blackboard classes to basically give access to this to the students as best possible. Or do I have to create my own list? Oh, yeah. 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 It's, um, it is separate to Blackboard, but you can export your classes and then import it into the app. So it's, it's a two step process. And right. So uh, it is possible that it's, it's, it's happening, but I don't think you're right if I can do it. Uh, no, you just download and then we can use that. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep. Just curious, how many people are interested in the gamification side, and on what topics or what disciplines that you're interested in specifically? Um, I would. Well, I, I would be interested. Although I'm not convinced any longer. But when I used to be keen in that, I was interested in electronic systems as well. I used to do this as PDP. At the beginning of every lecture, I would propose, uh, give them a problem be multiple choice problems and they do it in class they do it in the lecture theater and i get them to vote through vote a video or some other way of indicating that you know, getting them get uh, getting involved and then we put the terms on the screen but i think this probably is a better idea because that would facilitate students who don't turn up into lectures as well so from my perspective i have the content which is the matter of delivering it this way rather than delivering it in a lecture theater mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, I'm working with Maha at the LTU um, on some gamification of uh, yeah, for plagiarism purposes. So oh, we're looking at the uh, simulate software to develop a storyline. It's been a while happening, but we've just got some funding for the software, um, so which is hopefully going to be moving on moving really quicker now. Um, but I think it's great, and I think one of the things is you can do quizzes, obviously in Blackboard anyway. Uh, it's about making it more accessible, I, mm, I guess, for students, right. which is why these are so good. Uh, one of my very minor concerns is if, if this is an introductory unit and we're sort of saying students aren't using student email or Blackboard announcement and the rest of the conveners are in future subjects, it might be sort of setting them up for this. You know, we're expecting such a high standard of, of communication when everyone else is using that, that other platform of the student emails and, and Blackboard. Can I, make, can I make a comment about that? It's yeah. probably going to be um, politically uh, what, in, well, in, incorrect or perhaps career limiting. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've, yeah, it's, I've got a five year contract, I'll be out of here soon, don't worry. Um, so, um, uh, actually no, I still think I'm on probation, God, that's a bit worrying. Um, uh, it's a, it's, I would say that it is a mistake to, to say that your users have to do things in the way that you have decided that they have to do things, that in fact there's no point in communicating by email if the students don't actually read the email. You could, you know, you could tie them to to a chair and force them to do it, right? Or you could make really, really huge penalties. Or alternatively, you could do what Grunier and Vincent have done, which is to say the way that, that they actually communicate is by, by mobile. So let's have a mobile strategy in relation to it. And it's taken me six months to sort of work out, well, until I saw Grunier's thing, I was like, all right, well, what's gonna be the mobile strategy of the law school? And it's gonna be built around some variations of these sorts of things where we're actually gonna have to have fairly lightweight apps um, rather than, you know, thinking, I, I thought that the answer was, oh, well, we've got to get away from Blackboard and move to Canvas or something like that because it's a better LMS. And that's actually probably not the answer because the students don't engage in that way. No. And I, I do agree with Vincent that we need to... So I can keep my job? 
Right. Well, you know, but I want your vote, Ryan. Right. Can I kiss a baby? Right. Sounds good. Another question there. Um, individual users that uh, I cannot be identified if their question is correct or not. The analysis of overall on the question, how they got it right or not, is that also available to the individual users? Is the whole data available to the individual yeah. users? That's the question. Like a, a student gets a question wrong, can they then sort of find out how many others? Yeah. I don't know if we can. Can we find? Wrong? Yeah, that's. So it's, it's another sort of competition. Yeah. Level that, that you know, if they get it wrong and they see others, yeah. perhaps aren't doing as well, then maybe they're not quite as. Uh, yeah, performing as poorly as they thought. That they could yeah. be. And yeah. Might that's be a good point. Yeah. Can we do that, Vincent? Can yeah, it currently yeah. doesn't do that. But um, the only yeah. indication of how those students are going is like their overall point doesn't really drill down to say mm. they got. The student doesn't necessarily need to identify themselves either. They could put in any username because some students in the focus yeah. group said they would rather not be identified. Mm -hmm. So they can actually do that as well. Um, do I misunderstand your issue with emails that if students don't read emails, therefore you're suggesting this? Is this a replacement for email? It's not a replacement. No, it's simply that they said, well, we just don't read the emails. So I thought, well, there seems pointless me continuing to send them emails. I do through Blackboard, but I just wanted to come up with another way of communicating with them, and this well, is through the push yeah, notification yeah, on their device. More like forcing them to think about the subject, it's deep learning rather than just communication, and that's where my interest is in trying to get them to, you know, think outside the, the class mm -hmm. um, and answer a question which may have been discussed in, yeah, the in class. Student. Yeah. So it's really another form of getting them engaged. With that's right. So yep. to me, that's the way I see it. Is, am mm. I seeing it wrong? No, you're seeing it absolutely right. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, so we still know who the student is. That's it, because we have the record of their user email address. That's right. That's actually the one of the other ideas, Ryan. That's exactly so it allows us to intervene if we see students who are really struggling and we can now identify that first, second week and so on. That's exactly we'll use it as an intervention. Yep. Yeah. So, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was gonna say, so do you see the real the student's real name then in that? Yes. Case? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So we have all of that data. Yeah. The real data. Yeah. Great. I don't want to hold this, but just one question about you put in a numerical um, multi you said you got hundreds of students. Thousands. Thousands, Thousands of students. Yep. That. Um, do you find that maybe having randomized numerical values, uh, or we'll put it the other way, is there a problem when you've got 1,000 students answering the same question? Um, is there a sort of, do you detect any sort of <coughs> collaboration or any well, sort of I've one answer appearing on some internet site and being copied in by the others? Um, <laughs> No, but I don't think there's an issue with that. So this is about getting them to engage with the unit, and it allows me to see them which areas they're having difficulty with and so on. So it's not they're not earning marks for the unit by but doing they are, this. They're not. They're not. Right. Okay. So I don't think I don't believe they're yeah, in collaboration to work this out. We've decided for the moment not to have it as part of the um, assessment. The monitoring it to see. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. The questions are available basically on a 24-hour basis. Correct. Are you finding that students are sort of waiting till they're in a, in a lab or, or a lecture before they sort of log before in? Before they or log or in. Or is there a tendency to be outside that environment? I've just run it through a small group for the moment, but what a lot of the students actually said was they did it last thing at night before mm -hmm. they got into bed. Mm -hmm. Because they said they knew it would only take one minute to do, they could do it easily. Others said they did it on the train, coming in in the morning before class and so on. Yeah, but one of the things they really liked was it was 24-7 access, yeah. and when they felt like doing the question, they could actually do it at that point. So, yeah, yeah. so a lot of them said yeah. they did it as they got into bed, which is <laughs> interesting. <laughs> uh, Dan, I was interested in you mentioning about the motivational aspects of mm -hmm. gaming. Can you expand on that a bit further in terms of how you see that being useful in the higher ed setting? 
Um, yeah, so, so a, lot of, a lot of the stuff that we do with students is really demotivating. Um, so, so things like their grades and how they're doing, they sort of have a sense of their self-worth within that particular context. Um, so I'm a, a C student or I'm a past student or those sorts of things. It's actually really quite um, troubling. So the, the theories that we built, the gamification stuff that we did around is um, by two psychologists, um, Desi and Ryan at the University of Rochester, and they've got a thing called self-determination theory. It's a very well developed theory about, about the things that are important for people in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and the way in which you actually get people to do stuff. So, so one of the sort of the, the overall findings that we have is, uh, or that they, that they found in just thousands of different settings is um, that, that stuff that looks like it's going to motivate people often demotivates them once you take it away. So if you pay, a really simple example, you pay kids to read a book, the second that you stop paying them, they don't read books anymore. And the enjoyment of reading books is gone because you're paying them. Um, and so this extrinsic motivator, the motivator outside of their sense of self, their sense of mastery, competency, a range of other aspects, um, means that, that um, as soon as you take that extrinsic motivator away, they, they do worse. Um, examples also include things like uh, in creativity. If you pay people to be creative, they're less creative. Um, artists consistently say that their worst work is those which are done directly on commission and all that sort of stuff. So, so one of the, the, the trickiest parts about um, gamification, but, but more generally what we do as educators, is to think really carefully about what are the sorts of things which are intrinsically motivating for students. Um, our systems here are set up really badly, for, not at Swinburne, I mean generally in higher ed, set up really, really badly in terms of motivating people to do stuff. So one of the, the things that gamification offers is that we can find other ways of motivating people to do stuff and they're really, really different depending upon the nature of the person. So, so one of the things that I would, you know, I won't say challenge Gronya and, and Vincent on, but get you to sort of think about is one size doesn't fit all. Um, take competition, for example. Some people find competition really, really exciting. Other people absolutely hate it and will run a million miles away from it. You know, people are just different. They're wired differently in relation to it. Some people really, really care about social interaction. Um, I don't. I hate people. Um, uh, you know, and so on, right? So, so there are lots of these sorts of things that you have to think very carefully about. And so one of the tricky things about creating an app in these sorts of spaces or any kind of um, design is to think through very closely the way in which we can motivate some and have different sorts of structures. You know, for example, Geolingo really, really works for me in terms of setting a fairly high number of points that I have to do every day to make sure I do those exercises, right? For other people, it'd be like, oh, you know, really, right? You miss one, you've lost your streak, forget it, I'm never going to do it again. And, and so there have to be different sort of pathways into it. The, 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 the trick, if, you know, if I was going to say, look, in terms of the overall design, if you're thinking about this, identify a problem that we're not handling really well within education. Right, so I think the example that was mentioned before was loneliness. So I'm, I'm sorry, I missed who it was. Was it? Was it? Sandra. Sandra, right, Sandra. Yeah, loneliness. Right, right. Or, or that that our that our students don't learn how to work in teams, but we really, really don't want to use assessment as the blunt weapon to force them into teams because that's a terrible idea, which was demonstrated in our contract law class earlier this year. Um, thanks very much um, to the person that designed that. Um, uh, but so so what you want to do is you want to encourage this particular. Uh, problem to go away, uh, you know, or we want to encourage a certain thing to happen. Okay, what are the sorts of motivations that, that we can um, think that is going on in the minds of students? Are there ways of designing systems, we'll call it gamified systems, or others that actually can encourage that sort of behaviour? And typically I would do, you know, I, I think the great thing about um, Gronje and Vincent's uh, project, it's really, really lightweight. You know, it's, 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 you, you started with the motivation. You sort of said, look, we, we, we know that the kids are not reading their emails. We know that they're not actually engaging with this material. We want them to do one thing. We want them to engage in a really, really lightweight way, right, after class. That's just, that's just fantastic. It's a great starting point. Then you worked out ways of actually using these sorts of systems to encourage that, right, including things like, well, we're not going to bother with email because push notifications are the only way to go and the only way in which they're engaging is on the phone, so we'll design it around that platform and so on. So, I mean, everyone in this room, I suspect, in dealing with students in, in w whether it's administrative or academic capacity, has got a number of areas where you go, you know what, that's not working as well as it should. Right. I'm happy to you know, help anyone sort of try to think through the design process of using some of these sorts of things to do what, what Grania and, and Vincent's done. Uh, some great ideas in here. Can I ask, um, most of my students are at mature age. Um, mums, dads, 
with three or four kids working mm-hmm. on those that going online. Mm-hmm. Um, what um, background is there on, on mature age? Like you're talking kids, I know uni students. So I just call them kids for students, but yeah. What, are, they, are they different? Yeah, they're, they're, there's definitely, there's a ton of, of research in relation to, um, uh, the, I, I can't remember where the inflection point is, but it's, it's, it's in, the, in the 20s where um, you stop in, engaging with, sorry, at the moment, you stop engaging with mobile more than you do um, web, right? It, it's probably, I think it's around sort of 24, 25, right? Above 25, you can assume they're actually gonna be mostly web focused, right, unless they're above, um, you know, 70. Um, uh, if, they're, if they're below 25, they're mostly going to be mobile focused. And that, that obviously is changing dramatically and very fast. Um, but for example, if you were saying, all right, well, we've mostly got mature age students. Um, what do we know about them? Well, they're probably happier carving out time in the evening once the kids are in bed, and they're probably going to do that on, um, on a, uh, a laptop device or a PC. Um, And that means that you don't have to design it around mobile. You also don't have to design it with this sort of lightweight framework that um, that Grony has done where where basically it's, um, we're going to allow two minutes a day, right? And they're going to do it on the train on the way in because they may not actually be engaging in that particular way. So you sort of start thinking about, well, how, you know, at Swinburne Online, um, I guarantee you've got fantastic analytics about the way in which and when and how, right? So you design around the the existing cohort and and how they actually engage with that. And I think in some ways, getting back to Dan's point, you've come up with a problem that's pervasive at Swinburne Online, and that's a good example of where you can actually implement something like this as well. Mm. I have a question. You're using gamification in education, and so you sort of build uh, games to motivate people. Is there any research that sort of extends beyond that to the rest of the unit, makes them more motivated, you know, engage more with it there, or does it sort of stay at that level? Uh, you mean the level of it's only about games? Of, of the area that you're getting them to work in, or does it extend I'm, I'm look, to I'm the rest of the um, unit that you're working on that they become more engaged with the rest of the unit? Oh, um, there's, there's, there's very little data in relation to gamification. It's still fairly new, so we don't really know. There's, there's tons and tons of, of educational literature about, about you know, when you get people to do, students to do certain things, that that then flows over into other areas. There's, there's lots of educational psych stuff in relation to that, but it really depends upon the context and the nature of the, the thing that you're doing and, and so on. But I mean, I can direct you to some of that literature if you want. Just a follow-up on the, so it's built for iOS and Android, but is That's there right. a web version? Other questions, other, other points people want to make? I think probably one thing to come out of this, if people are interested in getting involved in this, maybe we could collect some of your names and feed those back to Gronia and Dan, if you like. So John, maybe you'll yeah, do our shoot and things. Yeah. 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 Or Dan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we're simply uh, getting interested parties who might be interested in trying it. The other, the other thing that I'm just, this wasn't scripted, but if, if people are interested in, in doing a sort of like a one hour gamification workshop or a, you know, educational motivation workshop to sort of say, how might we think through the problems that you've got? If you've got a problem or you've got an idea that you'd like to do, then I'm happy to volunteer, you know, to, to work with that. So maybe email yeah, you, Mark. Yeah, we've got a conference coming up mm-hmm. uh, in early September. So talk to you more about that if you like. That'd be a great time to, to look at that. How many would be interested in, in being involved in that side? So we've got quite a bit of interest in the audience in, in the area. That's great. And that'd be excellent there, Dan. Yeah. Okay. This has been a Swinburne production.